Hello students. Today we are still in chapter 8. We finished talking about profit last time. Now we're going to look at the production function. What a production function does is it tells you how much stuff the firm can make given its resources. So how many workers it has, how much machinery it has. Given all those inputs, how much can the firm produce? So the main inputs we'll consider are labor and capital. Now your book also adds land to that list of main factors. Um, most books don't do that. Most books just focus on labor and capital. So I'll also just focus on labor and capital. So for notation, we use L for labor. That typically refers to number of workers. Now, sometimes in some papers, it could refer instead to number of hours worked. So unless you see otherwise, it probably means number of workers. Now we use K for capital, and that's going to be the number of machines that the firm has. Now, I'm aware that capital begins with a C, not a K. So why do we have this notation? Well, the problem is that another very important variable in economics is consumption. Consumption also starts with a C. It would be confusing if the letter C could mean both consumption or capital. So to clear up that confusion, here's what economists do. We use C to mean consumption and we use K for capital. So this notation here is not just in this textbook. You'll see us pretty much everywhere in economics. So the production function is going to be a function of K and L. So how much you can produce depends upon how much capital, how many machines you have, and also how many workers you have. So here's an example of how production functions work. Let's say the firm's production function is the square root of K times L. So if the factory has 27 workers and three machines, how many widgets can it make? Go ahead and pause the video here while you think about that. When you think you have the answer, press play. All right, so let's go over the answer. So L is labor, that's how many workers you have. Our problem said we had 27 of them. K is capital, how many machines we have. So the problem says we have three machines. That translates into K equals three. So all you gotta do is plug L equals 27 and K equals three into this. So you get square root of k times l is square root of 3 times 27. 3 times 27 is 81. Square root of 81 is 9. So this means the firm can make 9 widgets if they have 27 workers and 3 machines. Now of course the production function isn't always square root of k times l. Different firms have different production functions. So here are some common examples you might see in other books or exercises. So you might have production is K plus L, so number of machines plus number of workers. You could also see something like this where production is the cube root of number of machines and labor to two thirds. This is a popular choice in macro. We talk about why it's so common in macro in one of my other courses, Intermediate Macroeconomics. <coughs> so now we talk about something called the Marginal Product of Labor, often abbreviated as MPL. So this definition is a little bit approximate. If you want to see a more precise version, go ahead and take the next course in this sequence which is intermediate microeconomics. 
So the marginal product of labor is the change in production when you hire one additional worker. Now, there are some myths about the MPL, and I want to be very, very clear about that. That's why I have these big red knots that are bold, underlined, all caps. Now, the MPL is in general not average output per worker. We'll see some examples shortly that make that distinction clear. So how much additional output you get when you hire an extra worker is not always going to be the average. It's also not the number of workers per machine. So one time I taught, I was teaching on principles of macro, and I spent a lot of time emphasizing the MPL is not average output per worker, and I successfully stamped out that myth. Unfortunately, my students then proceeded to invent a new myth, MPL is number of workers per machine. It's not true. Um, I'm hoping you guys do not create any new myths after I stamp out this one as well. Just stick to our definition here. Change an output when you add one more worker and you'll be fine. So here's an example of how that would work. So let's say when you have no workers, you get no output. That makes sense. Now, perhaps when the firm adds their first worker, they're going to be able to produce 20 units. So if output goes up by 20 when you hire one worker, that means the MPL is going to be 20. If you have two workers, now output's going to rise to 36. That is an increase of 16. 20 plus 16 is 36. So because you get 16 additional units when you hire the second worker, the MPL for that worker is going to be 16. Let's say the firm adds a third worker. When they have three workers, all of them together are producing a total of 50 units. Before, when there are just two workers, output was 36. So what was the contribution of that third worker? How much extra output did they produce when they had that last worker? Well, it's an increase of 14. 36 and 14 is 50. So MPL for the third worker is 14. Lastly, if you hire a fourth worker, now total output's going to go all the way up to 60. Before is just 50, so that's an increase of 10. 50 and 10 is 60. So you can see how this table is constructed. Just follow the arrows here, and that's how you find MPL. Now your books graphs look a little bit different. We'll see what your books tables look like on the other on the next slide. However, some of the homework problems are based on this. So and many other textbooks have a format more like this, so I want you to be familiar with this format as well. So here's what your book looks like. I'll keep on at the same example. Your book puts the MPL in between the numbers of workers. So you have zero workers up here in this row. They have one over here. You just insert that MPL right over here according to your textbook. So here, it's still constructed in the same way. If you have 20 units of output when you have one worker, and that rises to 36 when you hire a second worker, that's an increase of 16. So your MPL is 16 over here. 20 and 16 is 36. So here's another exercise for you guys to work on. So I emphasize that the MPL is not average output per worker. So here, calculate both the MPL and you'll find average output per worker, and you'll see for yourself that they're different. So go ahead and pause the video here while you fill in the rest of the table.
All right, let's go over the answer. So the MPL is the amount of extra output you get when you hire one worker. If you start out with zero workers and zero output, and our MPL is 25, that means that production is going to go up by 25 if you hire one worker. Zero and 25 is 25. So that's how I fill in this first cell over here. Following the same pattern, the MPL for the second worker is 15. That means that the second worker is going to add 15 units of output. So we start with 25 back here, and we're going to add 15 more. That's going to give us 40. So total output is going to be 40 when you have two workers. Now, the table already gave you how much output we had when we had three workers. That means we had 50 units of output. We had to fill in the MPL, though. So if output is now 50, and before it was 40, that means it went up by 10. Thus, MPL is going to be 10. For the last row, output is 56 when you have four workers. Back when we had just three workers, we had 50 units of output. So that means the output went up by 6. 50 and 6 is 56. So MPL must be 6 for that last worker. So that's how you find the MPL and total output. Now let's find average output per worker. So we had 56 units and we had 4 workers. So 56 divided by 4 comes out to 14. When we had 3 workers, we produced 50 units of output. That's going to be 50 over 3. Um, I guess that'd be 16 and 2 thirds. Is that right? Yeah, 16 and 2 thirds, if you want to do it that way. When we had 2 workers, we had 40 units of output. 40 divided by 2 is 20. We had 1 worker, we had 25, so 25 over 1 is just 25. So, remember I said, in general, the MPL is not average output per worker. If you go and compare these columns, they're different with an exception up here, but other than that, they are not the same. So don't confuse average output per worker with MPL. They are different. So you can also graph the MPL. So I'm just continuing with the same example here we just finished working with. So here is total output. We said we had zero workers. We had zero output. When we had one worker, we produced 25. So that's point is over here. Two workers gave us 40. So we have two and 40. And so on for the other points. So total output looks like that. The marginal product of labor looks like this graph over here. So the MPL was 25 for our first worker. So you put that over there. When you have two workers, the MPL fell to 15. So there's the second point in the graph. Three workers, MPL is 10, so that's over there. And four workers, MPL was 6. So that's the marginal product of labor. So in our next episode, we'll learn about the marginal product of capital, which is a closely related concept.